Good morning. It's uh, my pleasure to be back here again. Thanks to the organizers for inviting uh, Biotech Canada to come give you a few perspectives. It's fascinating. I'm from Ottawa, and uh, when I come to Toronto, I learn new language, things like mathematically eliminated from the playoffs. <laughs> so, yes, I am from Ottawa, the town that will have postseason hockey, but you have baseball. Good. And, and golf. Um, I was asked to give a talk about what keeps biotech awake at night and I thought well let's take something from the 80s and do the you know the David Letterman top 10 list and I was building my slide deck that's why you don't have it in your book because I got bored with it about halfway through and I thought, let's just talk about stuff that keeps biotech uh, awake at night. For those of you that were here last year I, was, I gave you a, I, I talked a little bit about some of the things that were sort of driving sort of the interest of the biotech industry and when I was thinking about like what would I put in a top list it really comes down to eh, generally three things technology money and time those are the things that uh, keep our companies awake whether you're at a pre-commercial stage or you're a commercial stage and you're acting in the, in the in the market and bringing your product there a couple of things you could that I showed you last year in terms of the success rate what's your success rate in taking a product to market after you enter the, leave the preclinical phase into your phase one, always a little bit depressing is that you got a 9% chance to come to market. So those of you that were expecting a question on this, sorry to disappoint you, but I already knew, you knew what the answer was. And when you look at that 9%, it's not across all areas. So I thought Russ's slide was great that talked about the breadth of technologies and all the different fields that are being developed out there. But the success rate in those varies as well. And you take a look at it, oncology, where you had most of the products were in oncology in that slide, they actually have the poorest success rate and actually getting to the market at the end. And those that have one of the smaller bubbles he had in there in terms of infectious diseases has uh, one of the higher success rates that come to market. And yet, ironically, in infectious diseases, that's where the time, so you have a technology question that's coming there, and the challenge you bring it, and then you have time issues. For those of you that are in the infectious disease uh, market, understand that those are probably the slowest adopted of technologies, as physicians typically want to save the newest stuff to the last possible moment, and then you run out of time because your patent expires. So in technology, we have three things that are generally driving folks' failure. Didn't make it, didn't work. Market acceptance, how long does it take to get to the market, and what are the fights and battles that we have to go through to ultimately get there? It's almost raised a question of futility in some, some companies' minds. But the other side is alternatives or copies. And then, so here's your first test for you out there. Which one of these can make a, which of these can one make a generic? And just, you know, show that it's a little bit more that, you know, remember biologics are larger molecular size, they're derived from living organisms, each cell line's unique, and they're difficult to produce or replicate. So what do you think? <laughs> we go. So the 30% of you out there, we have to have a chat afterwards. You can't make a generic biologic. You can make something that is, if I can get the next slide, swing it back over. You can make something similar. It's impossible to make something the same, um, identically the same in a biologic. As many of your companies know, Russ talked a little bit about drug shortages. I know my previous company, Genzyme, we Struggled a bit just to make our own product, um, let alone trying to deal with someone else's on there. That's the nature of biologics. As you grow these things, there are many complexities to deal with that one. But many companies get into biosimilars, and if you want to think about what keeps people awake at night or what keeps our companies awake at night, especially in the biologics field, are biosimilars, and what will they do, and how do they penetrate the market? And that's actually much of what Biotech Canada has been doing for the last six years, has been working on that framework for things like subsequent entry biologics. Not expected to read this. There's no test on this one, um, but it does suffice to know that we need to help get the education out there that biosimilars, subsequent entry biologics, are not generics. I'm not saying they're good. I'm not saying they're bad. I'm just saying they are different, and that leads to questions you need to understand. And much of what we've been doing in our work to help people understand that is working with physicians and roundtables and their experts, and working with patient groups, and working with all of them so that they will understand what this is. And I think, as you all know, when you talk to a physician, if you're to ask them, are all wines the same? Um, I think you realize that they think there is a difference between various Merlots and Cabs and other areas. That's the same thing within biologics. They're similar, but different. 
So here's the next question in terms of when I talked about technology challenges, money challenges. Money, money, money. That I hear at home all the time. Okay, so how much does it cost to develop a new drug? Russ gave you a hint at this one. What do you think? Interesting. You know, the answer is, uh, it could be any of them. Um, <laughs> depends who you ask. Last year, about a year ago, uh, Professors Lake and Warburton came out with a study that said the cost of developing a drug was only $59 million. The industry was just kidding everyone to thinking that it was the second one. The $800 million was uh, based on a tough study by DeMassey and Grabowski um, back in early 2000. The 1.2 billion is actually another study that they did three years later when they were comparing the cost of development between a biologic and a pharmaceutical small molecule um, that's out there and actually the costs were pretty similar. I mean there are costs of development and then you also got to take in the cost of failure. What was interesting, the 4 to 11 billion actually came out last month in Forbes. They did the back of the envelope calculation um, in terms of the truly staggering cost of inventing new drugs. Yeah, not scientific, but what they took a look at is the top pharma companies that were out there took a look at over the years between 97 and 2011, what was their total R&D spending? How many products did they bring to market? And they did that complicated division, numerator, denominator, got the calculator out, and they found the costs were between 4 and $11 billion is what these companies were spending to bring a product to market. So if you have any doubt um, that money's important, if you have any doubt that sales are important, because the sales pay for this, um, let you know that's what's keeping a lot of folks awake at night. But there is some good news, especially for the pre-commercial companies. I took a slide from my uh, colleagues in bio in the States. Just there did an analysis of what's going on in the market as it leads to the, the, the NASDAQ biotech index. And actually over the last four months, biotech's been outperforming amongst all other areas. We're starting to see money out there and we're starting to see Money started to go into various aspects. When we take a look at VC, we've seen a couple of announcements to like the Merck Lumira fund that we came out last week. Uh, we're seeing another other VC funds. <clears throat> but what's interesting as the money's coming back into space, it's not going where it traditionally went. And what's really interesting for us is that it's going into very niche markets, very niche areas, things like orphan diseases. And that's where the Bio Europe Spring Conference I was at in Amsterdam last week first big panel session was, the question was, is that the only viable business model that's out there for pharma now, is dealing with very niche or very personalized medicine? Interesting discussion, interesting debate, but that's where the money's leading. So that leads ironically to my next question. Which country do you think doesn't have an orphan drug policy? US, Canada, Singapore, Romania? All right, 80% is correct. It is Canada. You know, the Canadian view historically has been, yeah, we don't need one, the state's got one, we'll get it eventually. Well, 52% uh, of the drugs that are approved for orphan diseases in the United States, or 48% in Europe, don't come to Canada. We don't have a framework for it, we don't try to incent the development of it. It's fascinating when you think about it, Canadians are hurt most by this lackadaisical process. We've been at Biotech Canada have been lobbying for an improvement, trying to establish an orphan product policy, and that will be something we're expecting to see this year, is actually regulations coming out to define an orphan product policy process that will allow for, hopefully, market exclusivity, expedited reviews, fee waivers, whatever it takes to help us introduce these technologies. The next hurdle will always be in terms of the market access component of that one. But it's great news to see that Canada's finally, only 30 years later, catching up to uh, the leadership that we've seen elsewhere around the world. So I'll just close because I'm out of time and I'll talk a little bit about time because there's just never enough time. There's never enough time for development or it takes too long or we're running out short. Time for approval. <clears throat> Russ talked about the patent term uh, restoration, which is very important, but the times for approval are not speeding up. Private, not just licensing approval, but market access approval. And then time on the market, the exclusivity that we have. 
When you think about it, infectious diseases, as I talked at the beginning there, a little higher success rate, the adoption and penetration of the market for infectious diseases are notoriously the worst um, out there, the slowest adoption process, to the point where it runs a question, is it even economically feasible to bring a new antibiotic to market because it takes so long to penetrate the market that your patent runs out. There was an act in the United States, GAIN, the something antibiotic infectious sort of uh, initiative incentives for new drugs in that space that have been pushed through Congress or have been pushed or been brought to Congress a couple of times, still hasn't gone through, but to give even additional market exclu exclusivity for that area that people are looking for. So it's fascinating when, uh, whenever you hear from governments and payers, well, you industry people, you're never coming out with new antibiotics. It's like, well, no market. I mean, we'd love to, but it just doesn't make sense from a investment point. And the last thing I'll talk about in my, I'm over time here, but just in terms of approvals getting through, I'll only talk about the, the biologics genetics therapies director in terms of their time. So what do you think? What's been their performance in terms of hitting their NOC approval times last year? Their performance standards 90%. So what do you think they did? 47, 85, 94, 100. It's actually uh, number four. Ooh, yeah, on that one. Yeah, they, uh, they hit 100% of their targets. They are performing within the times they said they do in terms of that one. Now, granted, wasn't a lot of products coming through. Um, you take a look there, so you wonder, like, how could you not hit that? But within BGTD, they are hitting the timelines. What's fascinating in all this drug shortages stuff, I think it's the opportunity for us as an industry because when you read the government and they're saying, like, we're you know, really coming up with creative ways to get through reviews of new products and we're, we're starting to look abroad and see what we could use. It's like, ah, great, finally. We've been asking for that for a long time now. So maybe you can keep up that process. Hitting this standard is our expectation, but improving on it in terms of the actual timeline is even better. The little subtlety on this one, if you take a look at that one as much as they're 100% hitting, if you take a look at that last three quarters that have come through, they hit that within seven days. So. You know, it's not like, you know, it's like a mad rush at the end that they try to hit their timing. But they did hit their timing, so. Anyway, that's all I got for you this morning, and I'll look forward to taking your questions later. Thank you. Oh, I got to introduce Greg. Come on in, Greg. <clears throat>